Hello, and welcome to the fourth dialogue of U.S.-Japan Council's Japanese American and Japan Legacy Series. I'm Deborah Nakatomi. Diane Fukami and I are your hosts for the series of dialogues, highlighting the lives and journeys of prominent Japanese American leaders, each of them pioneers in developing the U.S.-Japan relationship. Through their stories, we explore the role of Japanese Americans in strengthening U.S.-Japan relations and how their experiences with Japan have contributed to their Japanese American identity and community. We'd like to thank U.S. Japan Council for providing this opportunity to share these unique and powerful stories. We would also like to thank our friends at Japan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs for their invaluable support of this program and of Japanese American leaders to nurture the U.S. Japan relationship. Today, we welcome Kathy Matsui former vice chair of Goldman Sachs Japan and chair of the board of counselors for USJC in Japan. We have reserved some time for questions and uh, we invite you to put your questions in chat during the conversation and we'll reserve time at the end uh, to take your questions. So Kathy, we're very excited to learn about your family story have you share your experiences about your career and perspectives on leadership um, on behalf of women in the workforce, which you are so known for. Um, so let's start by having you share with us your, your parents' immigration story and how their early experiences uh, shaped not only their future, but also your entire family. Sure, and thank you, Deborah and Diane, for doing this. Um, I couldn't think of a better pair uh, to be having this conversation with. So my parents are first generation Issei immigrants from Naraken, the first capital of Japan. Uh, they, uh, my father was from a farming family. Uh, my mother was actually born in China in Tenshin. And they grew up in the same town within Nara called Gojoshi. Uh, it's not a town, I would call it a village, uh, a very tiny village. And they actually, interestingly, met, they went to the same high school. There's only one high school, Gojo High School, but they actually really met, uh, believe it or not, in an Episcopalian church. Uh, my mother was converted to Christianity through her cousin, who was unbelievably an Episcopalian nun in neighboring Wakayama Prefecture, uh, who introduced my mom to Christianity. So she started attending this church and I'm not exactly sure how my father ended up um, you know, converting to Christianity, but I think through this sort of youth group that he was involved with, they did activities with this Episcopalian church and that's how you know, the two met. And so my father, the eldest of five children, the you know, eldest son, of course, um, he comes from a farming family. The expectation is very high that the eldest son is gonna take over the family business, the family farm. And after high school, my parents only attended high school in Naraken, uh, my father saw an ad in a newspaper uh, offering young Japanese men the opportunity to learn modern agricultural techniques, farming techniques in the United States. It was a joint program, I believe, between Japan's Ministry of Agriculture and the United States Department of Agriculture. So the only problem was my father um, was hoping to get sponsored by his prefecture of Naraken they did not have the money. So my father just scraped up all the savings he had to uh, afford to participate in this one year training program. So he ended up actually landing in a farm uh, uh, in California, in Palo Alto. And he lived there, worked there for one, one year. And you can imagine after World War II, uh, the difference between the United States and Japan back then, it was night and day. And so my father returned to Naraken, he just, he knew, <laughs> he had decided the fate of his life. He was going to go back to the, to the United States and realize his dream. He wanted a big farm. It was all about big, it was all about scale, right? And so um, he decided to return to the United States alone because they couldn't afford, uh, he had married my mother, had my, sis my sister was born in Naraken, couldn't afford all three uh, ship fare. It was a 10 day boat ride from Yokohama to California. And so my father went back by himself, uh, managed to get himself a green card. He actually had to publish a book on chrysanthemums, which was his crop at the time to get that green card, got it. And then uh, shortly thereafter, my mother and my sister immigrated and I was born uh, a year after that. And so um, typical, you know, 
immigrant story. My dad, I think, had one 10,000 yen note in his pocket. I looked up in his passport. It's like the equivalent of 35 US dollars. No English ability, really. Um, he was just going to, you know, figure it out once he got there. So that that's, you know, sort of my, and my poor mother just sort of dragged along. <laughs> Where are you taking me uh, to this foreign land uh, with, a, with a young toddler uh, in tow? So that was the beginning. Well, your father sounds like an amazing man. Um, and also our condolences for his recent passing. But, you, you know, your father and, and your mother put together the Matsui Nursery, which so many of us have heard about at this point. Talk a little bit about how that all started. Sure. So my father, of course, my, m both my parents worked in other people's nurseries once they first landed in the United States. My father's original crop was chrysanthemums, the national flower of Japan. He started Matsui Nursery uh, in 1967. And a short while thereafter figured out, well, actually Americans don't like chrysanthemums as much as Japanese people do. They essentially use them for two events, funerals and maybe some graduations. Uh, and that was pretty much it. And so he figured out there must be a higher margin floral product. And that landed him to um, figure out maybe the next crop must be roses. Everybody loves roses. And so, um, sorry, before that, to backtrack, uh, he took out a huge loan um, from, I guess today would be Union Bank, so Japanese bank. Uh, he only had like a 10 year uh, business plan that he drew up himself, no collateral, he said, just believe me, <laughs> give me the money, believe me. And the guy believed him and he built out this plan to build Matsu Nursery, which is today in the Salinas Valley of California. He has about 70 acres of greenhouses and he just you know, meticulously every year just built out uh, this business plan. And so he started with chrysanthemums, as I said, then he switched to roses. When I was living at home, uh, living on the farm, that's um, all I know is <laughs> basically roses. And, um, uh, you know, I remember kind of growing up and you have to keep in mind, we were not the only flower growers in the Salinas Valley in the 1970s and 80s. Salinas Valley was known as kind of the floral capital, uh, not just of California, but perhaps the entire United States. So there are a lot of other Japanese immigrant families besides my parents that had immigrated like my parents from Japan, many from Kagoshima in Kyushu to the Salinas Valley to plant their roots and to grow flowers. So I was surrounded by Nikkei families. I went to school with uh, many of their children. And for us children, it was atarimai. It was uh, given that every weekend, every summer break, uh, before Valentine's Day, Mother's Day, you were cheap child labor. <laughs> you were going to be put to work. And you could complain vociferously, which we all did, but that was expected of, of all of us to otetsudai, to help you know, out on the farm. So um, I think that that experience, despite my um, unending you know, complaints <laughs> uh, of why we had to do this, why our friends at school weren't you know, being forced to work like this, uh, it really shaped and molded the person I am today. And I frankly have two children who are um, you know, essentially adults now. And I remember often as I was raising my own children, oh, I wish I had some farm where I could give them, you know, some stoop labor <laughs> or, you know, uh, experience. Uh, because I think that experience for me taught me that, you know, money doesn't just fall from the sky or grow on the trees. You work hard and you earn money. And I think that's a set of values that I didn't really appreciate growing up, but I sure appreciate uh, now. Yeah. So you all worked really hard on the farm. I mean, I remember you telling us that although roses are considered a luxury flower, you have personal, <laughs> you have a personal disdain about roses from all the thorns that you've had to work with every yeah, year. Yeah, so right? my main job on the rose farm was what you call grading, which is essentially measuring the length of each rose. So all the cut roses would be brought into this shed. I'd be standing at this huge grading machine. It's kind of like a big machine with a conveyor belt. And you put the roses in one by one and into each tray, there would be sensors that measure the length and they would drop it in the appropriate you know, length uh, kind of buckets at the end. 
but I'd have to pick up each stem of rose, right? And I had literally five layers of gloves, okay, five. And despite having five layers of gloves, inevitably, you know, my, my palms would be pierced with thorns. And I, I, I guess I got used to it, but it was just like, wow, this is really painful. <laughs> I'm a child, should I be doing this kind of work? <laughs> but again, it was a, a given that that was what was expected to, of me. At least I could work in the cool shed as opposed to the very hot greenhouse. Uh, but you're right, uh, to this day, I do not like roses. And if my husband, Jesper, even dares to give me roses, <laughs> they get thrown into the garbage because I, I really don't like that flower. All right, so let's take you up almost to adulthood. We have some photos of you um, at your high school, Gonzales, I believe, and you're playing basketball. So explain <laughs> to us a little, love, love these old photos. So explain to us a little bit about yeah. the transition from high school to college and, and how you made the decision to go where you ended up going. Sure. So, you know, the way the school districts were, uh, lines were drawn, I, uh, where our farm was, uh, my sister and I uh, were, you know, assigned to Gonzales Union High School, which was the closest high school to where we lived. I would say Gonzales, um, I had a great experience, uh, but interestingly, you know, most of the students were, like us, children of immigrants. And I would say the vast majority were uh, immigrants from Mexico. So uh, a lot of the students that I went to school with uh, did not have um, either the desire or frankly means to attend college. So I believe in my class of, I don't know, 120, 130 kids, uh, very few, only a handful of us actually went on to college. And so at that time, so backtrack my sister, Teresa Matsui, who is five years older than me, she, much brighter than I am, she applied to Harvard University without even telling my parents and she got accepted. And when she got the acceptance letter, she showed my parents, she was so excited. They kind of looked at it. She said, they said, what is Harvard? And she had to bring out like, I think the map of the United States and say, well, it's over here, <laughs> here's Boston, but we're here in California, that's too far. And then they look at the tuition, right? that's too expensive. You know, you could get much cheaper tuition if you stayed in state. And I think she was about, you know, to get really frustrated until friends of my parents decided to visit um, our home from Japan. And they were saying, oh, where is Teresa going to go to college? And they said, oh, you know, she got accepted to the school that's called Harvard. You know, we don't know if it's too far too expensive. And they said, Matisa, Harvard, well, America no Todai. It's the Tokyo University of America. To which on a dime, my parents said, oh, okay. Well, of course she's going to Harvard. And so hence the story, the funny story of my sister paving the way uh, for myself. Uh, I actually got waitlisted at Harvard. <laughs> I wasn't that smart. And I somehow squeezed in and I end up at, you know, uh, in Cambridge. I remember like landing into Logan Airport and thinking this is the biggest mistake of my life. I'm gonna flunk out in freshman year, uh, but I somehow survived. Maybe that fear of failure just kind of kept me going. So who and are we really seeing here in this photo? These are my roomies, uh, not all my roomies. You know, we didn't have like the ability to take selfies back then. So some, one of my roomies is actually taking the selfie, but uh, Suzanne, uh, uh, Kim and uh, uh, Audrey uh, in Quincy house. Uh, so we all lived in these residential homes. And you can see we live the, the college life, <laughs> a lot of diet, diet Coke and, and snacks sprued over. Uh, and I ended up studying um, social studies. You know, what's that? That's like elementary school, but it's really about political philosophy. So every week I read a book literally like this thick, like uh, Das Kapital from Max Weber or De Tocqueville, <laughs> you know, Machiavelli. And I'd have to write a paper and read that book every week. It was, I don't know why I chose this really difficult major, but anyway, I, I pursued that. I only, my only exposure to Japan actually was to, to satisfy my language requirement, I took Japanese and I took Japanese maybe for two years. And as soon as I satisfied it, I was done. I didn't, I didn't specialize in other words, in Japan studies. Ironically, my sister did, my older sister did when she was at Harvard, she studied under Ezra Vogel. <clears throat> she was a Japan specialist, but 
um, you know, just didn't like occur to me that I was interested or, or maybe I wanted to pursue Japan studies and look where I am, right? So uh, it was a very kind of a funny, funny or, or, or serendipitous route that I that But I you pursued. did make your way to Japan, did you not? I did. So after, when I was um, uh, about to graduate from college, I had already applied and got accepted to graduate school. What I really wanted to become was a foreign service officer. Don't ask me why, I just thought, hey, you know, champagne receptions every week <laughs> you know, in different exotic locations, that sounds great, right? And I love to travel. And so I got in, but then um, before I graduated, my parents uh, said, well, you know, the Rotary Club in Salinas has a Rotary scholarship, which you could, you know, it funds your entire year or, or whatever to a foreign country. And why don't you apply? I said, sure, why not? Um, and it was my local Salinas Rotary Club. Um, and so I applied. I surprisingly got the scholarship and I actually got a longer scholarship than one year. I got two years, uh, which was, this is our, our, rotary, our rotary crew. There was about 14 of us from around the world. And we got one year of intensive Japanese training at ICU, International Christian University, followed by, we were sprinkled across Japan. I ended up at Kobe University in the graduate school. Someone uh, went to Hokkaido, Kanazawa, you know, Kyoto, et cetera. And so, that was the experience that changed my life, obviously. It was my very first time to go to Japan. So I didn't go to Japan until after college, right? So several weeks after graduating, I'm on a plane, I land in Narita Airport, and this is 1986, like just when Japan's economy was, <laughs> the bubble was just taken off. Everything looked like it was paved with gold, by the way. We were treated like royalty. You know, going from college life to, you know, this, this Rotary Scholarship Program was just incredible. They were so kind. We each got assigned a sponsor who took care of us. And that kind of uh, led me to get interest in Japan when I was in Kobe, because that is in Kansai or close to my parents' home in Nara. I was able to visit them uh, more often than I, uh, well, I was able to visit them really for the first time. And because I spoke some decent Japanese by then, I was able to converse with my relatives, particularly my father's father, my grandfather, who's alive at the time. Uh, my father uh, is talkative, but not as talkative as, as his father. And his, my, my grandfather, his father, experienced World War II, of course, and had all these fascinating tales and stories to tell about his, his life and his journey. And he loved whiskey too. So he'd like pull up the whiskey at 10 p.m. You know, usually elderly people go to bed by nine, but now he was like, you know, knocking back those whiskeys and telling us, telling me these fascinating stories. He also loved onsen. He loved hot springs. So he dragged me to all these like really remote hot springs, somewhere like in the middle of nowhere, like, a, like in the middle of a river. He just like stripped down <laughs> out of the car. He's like, hey, come with me. <laughs> like, here's my naked grandfather walking down the hill, like, oh my God. <laughs> really doing this um, but he was a hoot and um, that that really of course allowed me to discover my roots um, really connect with my relatives really understand where my parents came from because I think like a lot of first generation immigrants right and they were very poor and you know just out of high school they didn't really want to reflect too much about their past and so they want to move forward get their kids assimilated ASAP into American society don't look back and so I didn't really know too much about, I think, my parents' history, but I learned a lot um, during my visits there. So that was really eye-opening. And then I went back to graduates. I went to graduate school eventually. And in between the two years of my master's degree, I came back to Japan as an intern for, for the old Mitsui Bank. It's all now merged, right? But the original Mitsui Bank. And I worked as a, as a summer, like a, an intern, the very first foreign intern they'd ever had. I wore a, a very unattractive, frankly, uniform. It was pink and gray. We could talk about that later. I actually love the uniform <laughs> because I, I was sweating on the way to the office from uh, the subway. Uh, it was hot, it was summer, Japanese summer, so very hot. Um, but but from that experience, oh sorry, that experience led me to meet my husband, Jesper, Jesper Cole. He was actually helping. He went to the Johns Hopkins size uh, as well, the same graduate school. And he was already in Japan organizing the internship program. So that's how we met. And we met, uh, fell in love. I had to uh, return to Washington DC for my last semester, but I don't think I even stayed for graduation. 
once my last exam was turned in, I got in a plane and flew right back here to Japan simply to be with him. How crazy is that? I had no job. I had nothing lined up. I just knew, I just followed my heart, which is something I don't typically do, right? And so I came to Japan like, oh, and he had a job, but I was like, maybe I need to get a job. And that's when I started, you know, writing cover letters and sending it to people like Sony, Fuji Xerox, um, you know, McKinsey's. I didn't really know what, what to do. And finance was frankly not on the top of my list. It was more like, it, I didn't really know. Uh, but Jesper was working in finance. He was working in research. His colleagues seemed cool and funny. So that's kind of how I ended up in this industry. So lesson in life, you can do all the planning you want, but you just never know, you know who you're going to meet, when you're going to meet them. And uh, uh, you just go with the flow. Well, I love the story of you following your heart. I had never heard you talk about that. Um, so that, that's really interesting. So you mentioned that finance was not at the top of your list, yet you made your way to Barclays. So how did that Correct. happen? Correct. So all these, you know, I did all these interviews. And again, recognize the fact that this was, um, I was interviewing in 1989. So the absolute apex of Japan's bubble if I could walk and breathe, anybody could get a job, okay? Pretty much. And so I got several offers. And in finance, because Jesper was working in research, I only applied for research positions. And I actually got offers from three banks. And I had no idea how to decide. So I actually asked each of them, you could not do this today, but I asked each of them, give me half a day at each of your firms. And they did. So I got to spend half a day at each of the firms. And that was the best decision I think I ever made in my life because not the best, but one of the best, um, because you could really understand the environment, the people, the culture, because in an interview, you're in this closed room, 30 minutes with somebody you've never met. And you're supposed to decide you know, where you want to work. That's crazy, right? And so from that, Barclays was one of them. I ended up working there, frankly, because the people were funny. <laughs> they were lively. The atmosphere was lively. The trading room and the research floor, you could never have this today, by the way. The trading floor and the research floor were essentially adjacent to one another, right? The traders are screaming orders out and you know, research analysts were you know, talking out loud about their research, but it just seemed like a fun place to work. That was my criteria. Is it fun? Is it, you know, are the people you know, interesting to be with? And that's how I ended up at Barclays. And ironically, yes, for my husband was at the rival, one of the rival competitors, which is Warburg, SG Warburg at the time. And that, by the way, neither of these banks <laughs> exist anymore. But at the time, we were working for competing UK banks. And then in 1994, uh, Goldman Sachs Japan was searching for a Japan equity strategist, which was my role at Barclays. And um, I interviewed. And by the way, I was already the senior strategist at Barclays. And that's the position Goldman was searching for. <clears throat> so, you know, in our industry, frankly, it's very unusual for you to move sideways unless there's something, you know, really spectacular. So I was actually pretty reluctant to move. I thought, oh, an American investment bank, you know, Goldman had this reputation, I'm going to get killed now, uh, for being 7-Eleven in Japan, <laughs> you know, from 7 to 11. And, but um I wasn't that keen, in, in other words. And I went through the whole interview process. Everyone was very friendly. I actually asked because I was just married. And so I actually asked every single person who interviewed me, so what are you going to do if I'm pregnant? Because I definitely wanted to have a child, right? And they all gave the right answer, meaning, don't worry, you know, we will manage. And we will keep your, you know, your seki, your, your seat uh, open. Um, and whatever maternity leave you need, you know, we'll, we'll give that to you. It was very consistent responses, by the way. I was very, very impressed. Um, but I actually uh, basically said, no, I wasn't interested. In the end, I calculated everything and said, no, it's, it's a sideways move. Why would I, why would I do that? I like where I, where I am. And then Abby Joseph Cohen, I don't know if you've ever heard of her. Abby Joseph Cohen is a legend on Wall Street. She was... Um, uh, Goldman Sachs's long-standing U.S. equity strategist. So she was like my idol. But Abby and I actually overlapped at Barclays because she used to work at Drexel Burnham Lambert. And when Drexel's folded, Barclays Bank essentially bought like half their research team. And she was part of that. 
So interesting, we had about a year plus overlap together at Barclays. And then she got poached by Goldman. So she was already at Goldman. She heard that I was interviewing at Goldman. She heard that I wasn't interested in Goldman. And then she contacted me. She reached out and said, not that you're making a mistake, but she said, I think you should reassess your decision. Uh, as a Japanese equity strategist, you need to have a strong American research franchise, a platform. Um, Goldman Sachs is a bigger, better one than, than Barclays, blah, 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 and all these you know, reasons. But very, you know, she wasn't <clears throat> you know, really, really doing a hard push or anything, but just laying out from her perspective why I should change my mind. And so thanks to her, I moved to Goldman and as of last end of last year, I stayed there over 26 years. So, you know, who would have guessed? And I think it's not just Abby, but I had tremendous, um, not just mentors, but sponsors throughout my career. Uh, I think like most women, I lacked, tr I lacked all sorts of things, but especially confidence uh, in my role. You can imagine I was uh, the only female equity strategist for the entire duration of my career. We can talk about that later, mm -hmm. but I was foreign, uh, inexperienced and female where 99% of my clients, at least in Japan, were Japanese men. So I had like three strikes against me. Um, I had this sort of in inferiority complex all the time. Uh, so I really needed that support and, and people lifting me up by the bootstraps, giving me confidence, giving me that pat on the back and saying, it's okay. You wouldn't be in this position if we didn't believe in you. Uh, and that was really, really helpful. Yeah. So take us back a little bit. When you started at Goldman, what was the, uh, the environment <clears throat> like for women in the workplace? It surprised me when you said, when you asked the question about, have, being pregnant, uh, would, would you still have your job to come back to? The response was really surprising 20 years ago. And I'm just wondering, what was that environment like at Goldman for women in the workplace, a as well as just in society in general? Well, I think, <clears throat> I think you know, first of all, Goldman is not at all representative of, you know, overall corporate Japan, right? Mm -hmm. Goldman has standards um, for diversity and inclusion, um, you know, the, the, the way they evaluate their stuff, which is frankly why I chose a place like Goldman. I knew that the metrics for performance evaluation were quite objective and especially in research. So essentially, you know, our evaluation metrics are pretty transparent. Either the clients vote for you, there's like regular votes um, for research analysts every quarter or every half year or every year. And either they vote for you or they don't vote for you. It's really clear. And so, Based on that, that's how you, you know, get evaluated and you get promoted, et, et cetera. And it was really important for me, and, I, and this is advice I give to a lot of young women, is uh, where possible, um, you know, go, work for someplace, if you have you know, a choice that applies as transparent and objective performance metrics as possible. Because I think particularly for women, if it's more subjective judgment, or you know, because somebody's buddy buddy with the boss and you know, all that, all those politics, it's really frustrating. It's very difficult, right, to navigate that sort of system versus a more transparent and objective, you know, measurement system. But I think to your question, back then, in broader Japan, you know, first of all, you know, women uh, working mothers uh, not that common, and particularly in finance, right? Well, from the get go, there are not a lot of senior women at all. Uh, much less senior women that decide, you know, to have children. And I think back then, I'm, I'm not quite sure, but I know of several cases where their seats were not preserved, right? Well, you're, and, and in Japan, by the way, the maternity leave is typically like a year plus. In Goldman Sachs, it was an international global policy, which is four months. I just took four months off and, and came back to work. But in many Japanese uh, companies' cases, that is not, you know, the case. So, um, just thinking about that context, uh, I was just curious as to what the response would be, because this would be a very senior position, a very senior role. You have a blank of four months. How, how do you, how do, you know, clients deal with that? How do you deal with that internally? I was just curious about how they would answer that question. So it's kind of my little test uh, during the interview process. But so uh, when, must, did, it, yeah. when did it occur to you to take on <clears throat> the issue of uh, women in the workplace? And, uh, you yeah. know, you know, womenomics, which, you know, we've read so much about, but just the genesis in the very beginning of that, when did it first strike you? Yeah, so 
I had my son, my first child in 1996, Tycho, and I took those four months off and returned to work right after. And I noticed that around me, a lot of my mamatomo friends or my mommy friends, several of them, of course, opted to stay at home, become stay at home moms, totally respect that decision. But a, another large group of my friends, like myself, were working in full-time positions before they got pregnant, had their children, wanted to return to work like I had, but for a whole variety of reasons, found it very difficult to do so. And meanwhile, that's kind of my private life. In my profession, my career, this is 1999 when I first wrote about womenomics. I was already experienced a decade of, you know, Japan is sinking uh, under the weight of bad debts of the banking system, under deflation, uh, the economy is shrinking, uh, the fiscal deficit is ballooning, the demographic headwinds are fierce, right? Overseas investors who are about half my client base asking me every day, Kathy, why on earth should we invest in Japan? Because at the end of the day, there are only three drivers of any economy's growth, that is labor, capital, money, and productivity. And if labor shrinks, and it's supposed to shrink by a whopping 40% by 2055, according to the Japanese government projections, if all else is equal, the economy's potential growth rate will fall. So here I am trying to figure out, okay, how am I gonna come up with a positive response to this very challenging question I'm receiving from my particularly overseas customers? And here I'm faced with my personal, you know, kind of uh, observation. There's a lot of wasted talent. All I could say with the Japanese classic term, motai nai, right? It's a waste. So I thought, okay, none of my Japanese competitors, who are all male, by the way, are probably going to write about diversity. So I'm going to write about it. And it wasn't meant at all to be any kind of advocacy paper or anything like that. I was just curious. I looked up, you know, what is Japan's female participation rate? Oh my God, it's super low, right? Or the gender pay gap, super wide, right? And just as an analyst, I can play with numbers. So let's pretend, let's pretend if Japan could uh, close that gender employment gap, what could that do, what could that do hypothetically to Japan's uh, GDP? And no surprise, it would be, it would produce a huge boost. So that's kind of what led me to write about this topic. And frankly, speaking back then, the initial reaction from my foreign clients was, wow, that's really interesting, Kathy, you know, you should write more about this. My Japanese clients, meanwhile, like, hmm, almost should I, you know, kind of interesting, but, you know, where's the Nikkei going next week? <laughs> it was kind of the reaction. So it was really only until 2013, the second Abe administration, mm -hmm. uh, where maybe because over the passage of time, the government is frankly running out of options, right, for growth and really desperately seeking, finding straws to what, what's going to drive growth, what's going to drive growth. And then Prime Minister Abe suddenly announces, well, one of the key pillars for Abenomics is womenomics. And frankly speaking, first I thought it was a joke, and then I fell out of my chair. Like the Japanese government had never even whispered the words, you know, gender diversity <clears throat> or <clears throat> anything to do with <clears throat> women in the context of a national growth strategy, but he did. And, you know, I know there's a lot of criticisms around, you know, uh, the government and, and Abe or whatever, but I have to give him some credit for this, which is shifting the context of womenomics or gender diversity out of what I call the realm of human rights and equality, which some people really care about, but a lot of people don't. Shifting that into <clears throat> front and center, gender diversity is imperative for growth, not just for the economy, but for business performance. And <clears throat> once he did that, once the government did that, all of a sudden, you know, mainstream media, Nikkei newspaper started writing about womenomics. It was shocking, right? Like a full page of womenomics with a pink border <laughs> you know, on the Nikkei newspaper. Like who would have imagined something like that? So that was really what helped, I think, propel this whole agenda forward. I'm clearly not in position to take any, any credit uh, for this, I just helped jumpstart the conversation because I think at that point, people were looking for analysis, right? And my kind of strategy, so to speak, was mm -hmm. if I can provide objective 
an analysis, evidence-based analysis. That's the argument people can use to convince the disbelievers, right, the skeptics, mm -hmm. that gender diversity can actually drive growth. So you that frame was the issue. You framed the issue yeah. and it allowed other people to, to <clears throat> walk through the doorway. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So I guess you know what what's changed. Well, surprisingly, from going uh, from one of the lowest female participation uh, rates in the developed world, Japan is now uh, pre-COVID, of course, made it up to almost seventy-two percent, which is higher than the United States of sixty-seven and the EU, Europe, at sixty-three. Mm -hmm. uh, so a lot more women are working outside the home, which is fabulous. The problem is the quality of those jobs. More than half, in fact these Japanese women are working part-time as opposed to full-time roles. Now, of course, many out of choice, but the, the, the main, um, I think, area of improvement here is the dearth of women leaders. Private sector, too few managers. Uh, public sector, too few women in parliament. Um, so we got the numbers up, but we need the quality of what they're doing to improve uh, going forward. So a lot of work cut out for us, but at least I think now, mm -hmm. I don't have to explain what diversity is anymore, whereas before it was just a katakana term, you know, like daibashiti, you know, it wasn't even a Japanese term. I don't have to explain that anymore. Now it's come to the nitty gritty of, okay, how do we actually practically apply this? How do we execute this? And I found that aside from, oh, we don't have enough daycare centers or the tax system is um, not giving enough incentives to families to encourage women to work outside the home. I found that a lot of companies I spoke with about womenomics were struggling with internal to their organizations. They had been able to attract very high quality female talent only to see them, you know, poof, disappear out the window after years five, six, seven. And so I published this book last year, which really talked about from my vantage point, <clears throat> albeit from a, you know, I work for a foreign investment bank, so it's not uh, representative necessarily, but as a, uh, you know, young female, you know, uh, employee to a manager, uh, managing a team across Asia, I have encountered a lot of differences between men and women, how they react to performance reviews, how they react to potential promotion opportunities. And so I've just shared, shared in this book, some of the mm, tips, uh, mistakes I've made, you know, lessons I've learned uh, throughout my 30 year career and try to share some of these tips with uh, Japanese society, both so the title managers, of but the also book women. <laughs> is How to Nurture Female Employees. We showed the, yeah. the book cover just a moment ago. Yeah. Sorry, it's only How in Japanese. Is it available, <laughs> is it available yeah. in English? People have, no, people have asked me in English, but it's really kind of geared towards the Japanese audience. Um, I think some of the content might frankly be a little bit too obvious in English, but yeah, if I... But thanks to COVID, actually, I was able to write this. So <laughs> maybe if COVID extends, I might be able to translate it. But it's been uh, selling quite well, I'm uh, glad to say, in Japan. So, um, so, yeah, so what are of some of those, those lessons learned? I know that they're embedded in the book. And uh, when we spoke with you, you have, you have some really kind of hard knocks lessons that you yourself have, have experienced. But when you talk to young people, uh, young women, I know you spend a lot of time mentoring uh, young people. What are some of those lessons that you've, you've taken away from your experience? Sure. So <clears throat> when I was first starting out as a young strategist, um, and just picture me, uh, you know, obviously young, inexperienced, foreign, my Japanese isn't at all perfect. And I'm going into some big asset management uh, company's office. I step into this room. There's 10 people. You know, the, the most senior Bucho is sitting in the, in the middle, flanked by his juniors on each side. I start my presentation on where the Japanese stock market, I think, is going. And literally within the first 30 seconds, the guy, the Bucho stops me and says, he interrupts and says, that's not true. Or, you know, your assumption's wrong. And this proceeded for a painful one hour. And it was like a machine gun <laughs> shooting bullets at me at every opportunity. And I was not alone. I was with my salesman who was so embarrassed. He was just like looking down, staring at his note notebook the entire time. And I was literally, I, 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 kind, I held it in, but literally when I got into the taxi, I was just, I flooded in tears. I was just so broken. 
And then the salesman kindly said, look, when you get back to your desk, I want you to do the following. That is write up a list of 20 clients. You are going to call each of these clients, they're all men, every week, once a week. Can you promise me that? I said, sure, I'll do that. And in, in this list, it was a mix of you know clients I knew and clients I didn't know, like this guy. And so I said I'd do it. And then about a month later, he checks back in. He says, and there's in, in the company I was at, he said, they have a call log. <laughs> they know who I'm calling. I said, Kathy, I know what you're doing. I said, what? I'm calling. He said, no, no, you're calling the clients who like you already. You're not calling the people who don't like you or you don't, you know, you haven't penetrated yet, right? In terms of traction. I said, yeah, but you know, they don't answer my call or I even know if they're listening to me. Maybe this is the, the era of handsets. They'll probably put the handset in their desk and, not, and, and ignoring me. I said, no, 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 no. That's the wrong approach. In order to grow, you've got to call the difficult clients. So I really hated this, but I forced myself to call the difficult ones, including this gentleman, that Bucho. And it was so painful. And he really continued to give me a hard time. But over the years, um, we became very close. He became actually one of my top clients. Uh, one of my favorite clients, because he challenged me. He didn't just take what I said, you know, at, at face value. He questioned me. He challenged my assumptions. He helped me grow. And now he's super senior and, you know, I, I'm total respect for the guy. But my lesson there is, you know, you've got to go with the difficult clients. You can't ignore them. This is the same with my children, right? Don't avoid the, the difficult opportunities or the challenges. Go through them. That's the only way humans, you know, will grow. My second piece of advice is particularly for women. Uh, some people ask me, what's the worst piece of advice you've ever been given? And it is this, keep your head down and someday some invisible hand will magically lift you to your next promotion. Totally false, at least in my experience. Now keep your head down and do a good job is you know, obvious. Be excellent at whatever you decide to do. But it's not always the case that some invisible you know, hand is gonna lift you, right? And I think men have a much better sense of, they've got antenna, right? They're always monitoring the landscape. Like, where's the next promotion? Oh, this guy's gonna be moved to that position. So that position is gonna be free. I'm gonna go for that. I'm gonna tell my boss, I'm gonna go for that, right? Women, I think, particularly in my case, I just, if I do my job well, it'll come. That promotion will come. No, 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 no. It's not, life is not that simple, right? You've got to keep that antenna up at all times, right? And while it may be more tricky, uh, I'd say challenging for women to network and do all that, being uh, not afraid and courageous enough to promote yourself. The promote Self-promotion sounds really arrogant, but educate others about your achievements, about what you've done is super, super important for visibility, right? For impact. And I will tell you, and again, I don't think I'm, uh, this is unusual at all, but in my career, if I could count the number of men who come into my office and told me about themselves versus the number of men, the number of women, it's just you know exponentially different. And those men didn't always have a lot of you know interesting things to say. They just wanted to have FaceTime with me, right? And I think that's the, that's what men are frankly really good at, right? Or they just grab me for a second. I just need to catch up with you for two minutes. Like who doesn't have two minutes? Of course, I say yes, right? But women, they book me on their my calendar three months in advance. They bring a PowerPoint presentation about what they've done. It's totally different, right? So anyway, that's what I kind of advise young women is, you know, keep those antenna up, keep your head up, be aware, uh, uh, be aware of the opportunities and talk to people about how great you are. You're great, right? And have the confidence uh, to say that. That's great Sarah, advice. We want to remind people that the chat is open to submit your questions. <clears throat> we reserve a little bit of time at the end. So please continue to submit your, your questions in chat. Okay. Sorry, Diane, go ahead. So Kathy, I was going to say, thank you so much for that advice. I wish I had heard it when I was younger. <laughs> um, so before we, before we pivot to a, another topic, you know, you've had 26 very well-respected years at Goldman Sachs. It would be remiss of us to ask you if you are at liberty dis to discuss what your future plans are right now. <laughs> Professional dog walker. <laughs> <laughs> that, that sounds pretty good. I'm pretty, I'm pretty good at that. 
no. Um, so I can't disclose yet, but let's just say it will be the intersection of finance, uh, diversity, and sustainability. Great. So stay Good. tuned. Oh, and we're, we're crossing our fingers and wishing you all the best. Thank Let's you. go now a little bit to your personal life, because I know that's something that, that you hold cl closely to you. We have this wonderful photo of you and your husband's, I think it's your wedding photo. Um, and, you know, <laughs> we, we love the story of this young love that is that it still continues today. Talk a little bit about some of the highlights and the peaks that you two have faced. I mean, here you are both gaijin in Japan. And mm -hmm. there must have been a lot of challenges, both in parenting, in, um, in health, in your case. Um, and, and so give us a little bit of insight into that. Sure. Um, so by the way, I didn't talk about my, my mother, but my mother, dear mother is an Urasenke tea ceremony sensei. She is 86. <clears throat> that kimono, um, reason I'm bringing it up, is um, an old kimono. And my mother has lots of kimono of course, uh, from teaching, but uh, she has really been my rock, um, of course, with my father's passing, especially, I just spent a month with her and uh, she is, thank God, healthy in mind and in body and spirit, uh, but she is somebody who's not only uh, deep in her faith of Christianity, but she really, really wants to preserve Japanese culture. If you walked into our house in California, you would think you walked into Japan. <laughs> we have rice, you know, the rice cookers go in, miso, miso soup on the stove. We have Japanese, you know, magazines on the coffee table. She has NHK satellite blasting the entire day, by the way. She knows the weather before in Shibuya before I wake up. <laughs> it's so funny. Oh, it's raining today, isn't it? I think, mom, how do you know that? You know? Um, and she makes osechi ryori, the New Year's, New Year's meal, totally by hand. I thought all Japanese mothers made it by hand. And I come to Japan and I said, oh, you buy it at a department store for this amount of money? Wow. You know? uh, we made mochi every every New Year's. Um, and she not only does Urasenke to, at a, a tea ceremony at a very high level, um, she's teaching teachers, but she is a sumie artist. Um, she does shodo calligraphy. She's won prizes on that. Uh, of course, Ikebana, uh, all these things. And so she's just a Renaissance uh, woman. And I'm so proud of, of her. So I just want to mention my, my mother. But going back to my, my I guess, my uh, husband, Jesper. So he's German. As I said, we met in Japan. Um, so we met in Japan. Uh, we had children, our two children, uh, Taiko and Priya, were born here. Uh, so none of our relatives or close relatives were in Japan at the time. And... Uh, I guess in, yes, that's my, you know, Mama Charin uh, taking Taiko for, for a bike ride. Uh, but to this day, by the way, I, I don't drive in Japan. I got a light, my driver's license in California at age 15 and a half, but I've never driven in Japan. I, I'm, I'm very scared, but I, I'm a mean bike bicyclist. And uh, so in 2000, year 2000, I was at Goldman. I had just been promoted to become the first female partner at Goldman Sachs Japan. I just had my second child, my daughter, that year. And I was also ranked number one in, doesn't mean anything to you, but institutional investor ranking of, of, of equity strategists. So I was kind of on top of the world. And then in 2001, I was diagnosed at the age of 36 with breast cancer. Now, it didn't come as a total shock to me because my mother had it, uh, both my grandmothers had it, so I knew I was uh, at some risk, but I didn't think I'd get it at age 36. And so, of course, I was in denial, and I remember even t telling my colleagues, I said, I'm too busy to have cancer. <laughs> it's got, I got to put this on hold, right? But I decided um, to, my, you know, my younger brother, one of my younger brothers is luckily an oncologist. He was at Johns Hopkins at the time. And he kind of navigated me through the whole US medical system. And I got treated at UC San Francisco where he did his residency, fantastic doctors. And I ended up staying in California for eight months, uh, surgery, uh, full chemo treatment uh, and, and radiation. And by the way, that's 2001. And what else happened in 2001? September 
11, 2001 happened. So my husband was working at Merrill Lynch at the time on his way. So he visited me in California on a business trip to go to New York City on September 10th. On September 11th, my sister in Minnesota rings me and says, turn on the television. And of course the Twin Towers are burning, right? She said, isn't Jesper in New York City? I said, yes. He said, do you know how to contact him? I said, no, he doesn't. This was, we didn't have cell phones back then. I have no contact information. I have, I have no idea what's happening. Of course, the phone lines were down anyway. So it was a harrowing, uh, <clears throat> I don't know, two, two days or so before he finally um, made contact with me. And so you can imagine my mother was like, oh my God, my daughter's gonna die of cancer and my son-in-law is gonna die in a terrorist <laughs> attack. Uh, was <clears throat> So we, we've kind of been through a bit in, in our lives at a pretty early, early uh, stage, but um, and we're very, people who know us know that Jesper and I are quite different in personality, but the yin and yang somehow, <laughs> somehow work. Uh, his parents have uh, since passed. Uh, it, they were just incredible people. Uh, we spent a lot of time actually when our kids are very young in Germany, because uh, they were more, uh, they were elderly and couldn't travel as much. Uh, so I managed to kind of pick up some Deutsch along the way um, and uh, really, really cherish, you know, that time. So we have a Japanese American German sort of cultural heritage, I guess, in our family. Uh, I won't even begin to say that the conversations in our home directed at kind of uh, the American political environment <laughs> from uh, part of my family who just said, oh, you know, America's terrible and America's this. I'm kind of like the only low pure American in the family having to defend, you know, American values and all of this. But anyway, <clears throat> we have interesting conversations. Our, our children are 24 and 20. Uh, they're both actually uh, one's in Berlin right now. The other is heading to Berlin, ironically, his job. So they're going to discover, I think, they're the half of their heritage uh, from from here on. But um, you know, both the Esper and I've worked in finance uh, most of our careers, and our roots have been here. We've lived here for over thirty years. Jesper uh, came as a student uh, to try to do a PhD at Kyoto University, ran out of money, and ended up you know getting a job. So we're both here out of serendipity. Um, but love Japan and uh, love uh, working with, you know, any organizations like USJC that nurture this relationship between the US and Japan. So Kathy, we have time for just one more question before we start taking, um, before we start taking questions from our viewers. You know, you're such a personification of the best in terms of relationships be between Japan and US. Tell me about your perspective of um, USJC and also any reflections that you might have about Irene Hirano Inouye. So USJC is really the first and only organization as a Nikkeijin that I really identified with. Um, it wasn't like, um, you know, they're all about political advocacy. It was really about people to people relationships across the Pacific. Um, the micro relationships that are necessary to make this bilateral relationship work. And I felt that as you know, a young person, a young adult studying in college, you know, Japan is number one, as Professor Vogel wrote about, to, oh my God, is Japan gonna be relevant, right? During my professional career. And so I could feel this palpably when I visited the United States talking to investors. Like, so tell me about companies besides Sony and Toyota. Like, people had very little knowledge. And those people like in my generation who'd studied about Japan, who were knowledgeable about the country, about the history, about the economy, they were frankly just dwindling in terms of population. So for me, I felt a sense of uh, a bit of urgency that we don't have the numbers of Japanese, you know, first generation or even second generation that other maybe Asian communities had. And therefore the knowledge um, and the affinity with Japan was starting to shrink, I felt. And whether it's my mother, you know, wanting to pass on the tradition of tea ceremony that I think is so wonderful. You know, when, once she's gone, yes, she has other you know, students who can teach, but it's really going to, you know, uh, you know, shrink very, very dramatically. So to me, USJC symbolizes, you know, the preservation of this bridge between these two nations. Um, at this very, very meaningful people-to-people -people level. 
And Irene, I remember meeting her, you know, I can't remember exactly the first time we met, but I think it was probably on a Japan America leadership delegation trip that she came to Japan with these really people like you, you know, bright and eager people wanting to be, they're very curious about what is Japan. And we have some Japanese heritage, but not really understanding what Japan is all about. And just her vibrancy, her enthusiasm, of course, she's so she was so super connected with all you know the people at very very senior levels in both co uh, countries, but she just had this warmth about her that everybody she spoke to you could feel how sincere and how genuine her love for both countries and that relationship really was. So that's what really drew me uh, into the council, and I'm so proud of what it's achieved um, in not just the Tomodachi program, but so many activities and so many initiatives that have really helped nurture this relationship. So I think we're ready to go to a couple of questions. They've been <coughs> populating our chat um, as we've been going. So um, here's the first one. Her name is Maria and she's asking, do you feel more Japanese or American having chosen to return to your parents' birth country? From a fellow second generation Asian American, thank you so much for your invaluable advice. So quick answer to that question is I still feel American. I still feel like I think my formative years were obviously in the United States and my values, um, the way I think, the way I speak, you know, can you imagine me going into a big Japanese financial institution client's <clears throat> you know, office and <clears throat> not that I had to become a Japanese woman, but I really had to become much more polite, right? Mm -hmm. um, had to res had to be respectful, like who's the most senior person in this room, make sure that I give him my meishi first, you know, all these things that I never really had to worry about when I'm, when I'm in the United States or elsewhere. So I still feel American at heart. I still, of course, English is my native tongue. Uh, I still read more books in English than I do in Japanese. But at, at the same time, I feel like there's a, a part of me that is deeply Japanese, that I just love um, the history and the deep culture and you know the nuances that I thought were kind of quirky as I was growing up. Like, why do they, why do my parents do this? Or why do they, why do they say these things? And now I get it, right? Especially as a parent, right? You just don't understand until you become a parent and you're faced with you know uh, raising teenagers or whatever uh, whatever it is. So really tremendous respect for my parents and what they had to go through, right? I, I had a very easy life, frankly. It was. It wasn't. You know, uncomfortable. I. Uh, yes, I. I was. You know, for, maybe forced to work on the farm, but other than that, I was. I was a very happy kid, and I got the opportunity to. You know, live and work in Japan. I work in an air conditioned, beautiful office. I didn't have to work in a greenhouse and in stoop mm -hmm. labor. I'm very, very lucky. Um, I have to say, so very, very blessed. So we have time for one more question. Um, this is a good one. When, in your opinion, will Japan have its first woman prime minister and how will it happen? <laughs> well, first we have to get the ratio of parliamentarians up from 10%, which is lower than Saudi Arabia, Libya. And I am working with one female parliamentarian on this very topic right now. Um, I think Japan does need to institute some form of quotas uh, in the public, public sector sphere. I don't know the answer to that question. I hope it is within our lifetimes. Um, maybe, maybe we'll see uh, something like that. But at the, at the minimum, I think we just need, generally speaking, overall more represent, representation uh, in decision-making positions of females, and not just females, of all you know, uh, LGBTQ, of uh, people with disabilities, uh, people with other ethnicities. Uh, we just need more uh, what I call cognitive diversity. Uh, it's not just about gender. And I think with that cognitive diversity, will spring innovation, innovation will spring growth. Uh, and that's, I think, the key uh, to a brighter uh, Japan future. Well, thank you so much, Kathy, for being us. We've learned a lot from your life experiences and we also can't wait to see what's next for you. Thank you so much. Uh, we wanna Enjoy thank everyone for tuning in today. Thank you. Uh, your support of USJC and programs like this allows us to continue to bring high quality programming. Once the webinar concludes in just a moment, you will uh, be redirected to a feedback survey. So please stay tuned. We'd love to hear your thoughts on today's program. We'd also uh, like to share about our next upcoming final live webinar. It's on March 3rd. We'll have a double feature with a pre-recorded interview with USJC board member James Higa and a live interview with USJC Board of Councilors Dan Okimoto.
Registration will be announced very soon. Thank you so much for joining us today.